la registrazione oh ok so hello everyone i think that it's time to start the speaker of today is uh, pietro bergamini Pietro got his uh, master's degree in uh, Ferrara a few years ago. Then he moved to Padova, where he got his uh, PhD working mainly with uh, Piero Rosati on galaxy clusters and uh, lensing models. And uh, since last November, basically, he moved to Bologna at the observatory, where he's postdoc here, working mainly with um, uh, Massimo Meneghetti on uh, simulation of gravitational lensing in the context of, uh, of Euclid. Today, he's going to talk about improving galaxy clusters, strong lensing models using both lensing models and internal kinematics of uh, galaxies in uh, clusters. And uh, so, Piero, you, Pietro, you can start. Before you start, however, I will just point out that it's good that you turn off your cameras and uh, wow. mic. On. and then we will have question time at the end so book yourself on the chat and i'll give you time at the end of uh, pietro's talk so please pietro thank you okay thanks a lot and thanks also for the opportunity to present my work here and okay so let me start um, by discussing uh, why it is important to study galaxy clusters. so galaxy clusters are the largest gravitational bound structure in the universe and a large fraction of their mass is in the form of dark matter. We are speaking about the 80, 90% of the mass in dark matter. So essentially, the galaxy clusters are the perfect natural laboratories to study, for example, the lambda CDM paradigm of strato formation by, for example, uh, uh, comparing the um, distribution of the sub halo of the galaxy inside the cluster with the prediction of the state of the art and body and hydrodynamical simulations. But cluster can also be used, for example, to uh, probe uh, the, um, the physics and the properties of uh, dark matter particles. Because, for example, I want to remind you that uh, the strongest evidence that we have of the uh, dark matter existence comes from a galaxy cluster, the bullet cluster, and from the offset, for example, of a baryonic component of the mass from the um, gravitational mass, the total gravitational mass of the cluster. And then you can use also uh, galaxy cluster, for example, to study or to uh, test modified theory of uh, gravity. But uh, in any case, what you need is a, uh, a reconstruction of the mass profile of the cluster from the center up to, for example, at least the virial radius of the cluster. And to prove this mass distribution over this large radial range, obviously you need different ma mass probes. For example, if you are interested in the central region of a cluster, you need uh, to know the stellar kinematics of a BCG galaxy that reside in the very center of a cluster. Instead, if you are interested in the outer part of a cluster, you can use with lensing on galaxy dynamics. But if you are interested in, the, in a mass range between few kiloparsec and few hundreds of kiloparsec, the most effective technique is the strong gravitational lensing. And in strong language, essentially, you use the position of the multiple images in the field of the cluster to constrain a parametric model for the mass distribution of the cluster. And um, so, essentially, the, the cluster acts as a cosmic telescope that is able to split uh, the background sources in different multiple images. And in recent years, we are observing a, a transition between the old lens model cluster and a new generation of high precision strong lensing models. And this transition uh, was possible thanks to a uh, recent uh, observational campaign, for example, that provided high quality photometric data and also follow up spectroscopic obs observations. So just to give you an example, the CLASH program, for example, observed 25 clusters in 16 HST bands, while the uh, spectroscopic campaign called CLASH VLT provided thousands of redshift inside the cluster field of view. So obviously, the strong lensing also other application. For example, you can use, since uh, I already said that the cluster acts as a telescope. So, can split the multiple images, but it can also magnify the background sources. So from the magnification maps from the lens models, from the cluster lens model, you can, for example, study the population of faint sources, faint background sources at 
high redshift that are the progenitors of the current galaxies and that also have a major role in the reionization process of the universe. And another application of the strong lens is, is for example, the cosmography. So, for example, a paper by Grillo a few years ago um, demonstrated that it is possible to constrain, for example, the value of H0 and omega mat uh, within a few percent just using uh, the time delays between different images inside the cluster. So let me now um, spend a few slides about the uh, parametric strong lensing model of a galaxy cluster. So when you parameterize the total mass of a cluster, it is usual to separate the total mass into the sum of different components. For example, you have a cluster scale halo that is used to describe the host halo, halo of the cluster. It is made essentially of dark matter, and it contains also, for example, the stars that form the intra-cluster intra light of the cluster. Then you have a second component that is made by hot gas. So uh, in my model, for example, the hot gas is uh, parameterized through the DPAE's profile. The DPAE means uh, dual pseudo-isothermal elliptical mass distribution. And uh, this particular mass distribution is essentially an isothermal sphere with a mass of its scale according to the sigma zero value, that is the central velocity dispersion. And this profile has also a core radius and a truncation radius uh, as parameters. And for example, for the hot gas, the, the three parameters of the DPAEs are fitted, as explained, for example, in Bonamigo 2018, by uh, X-ray observation from the cluster, for example, by, uh, from the Chandra X-ray observations. Finally, the third component of the cluster is the, is the clumpy component. So uh, this component takes into account the contribution to the mass of the cluster coming from cluster member galaxies. And obviously, um, the number, the position of the multiple images are not sufficient to constrain all the parameters of the DPAs of each galaxy. So it is usual in lens model to use scaling relation mm, uh, to scale, for example, the central velocity dispersion and the truncation radius of the circular DPAs that are used to describe the galaxy. So essentially, just to summarize, the galaxies are parameterized through a um, circular DPA's profile with a, neg a negligible core radius and with a central velocity dispersion and a truncation radius that scale in this way with, with the galaxy luminosity. So when you constrain, when you optimize the lens model, in reality, you are just optimizing the value of the two normalization, this one and this one, and the two slope. And between the slope exists a relation that is written here, where gamma is essentially the mass to light scaling of the galaxies. Now, the problem here, OK, this, is, this slide is just to say that we, um, in lens model, you are minimizing this particular key square um, of the position of the multiple images. But uh, the problem is that despite the fact we are using hundreds of, of position of multiple images to constrain the, the lens model, the lens model still suffer for strong inner degeneracy between the mass parameters. So for example, in this plot, I'm showing one of the most famous degeneracy uh, in the lens models. And this is a degeneracy between the, trunca the reference truncation radius and the um, reference velocity dispersion um, of the cluster member scaling relation. So essentially, this degeneracy says that it is equally probable, if you want, to obtain um, an equal a uh, good model if you decrease the value of the center velocity special, but you increase, for example, the truncation radius of a galaxy. And OK, so in my work, uh, for the first time, we tried to put uh, additional constraint on the cluster compo on the um, galaxy component of the cluster using the major stellar kinematic of the cluster member galaxies. Essentially, um, the aim of my, of my work is to use the galaxy kinematics to, to reduce the degeneracy between these two parameters of the scanning relations, of the cluster member scanning relations. And this is my data set. So in my work, um, in the work that I uh, developed during my PhD thesis, I, I consider uh, three clusters 
all the three clusters were observed during the Clash and Clash VLT programs. Two of the three were also observed during the Hubble Frontier Field pro program that provide um, deeper uh, observation in uh, seven uh, HST bands. And the most important thing is that all the three clusters have deep news pointing in their core. And why it is important? Because essentially, to measure the stellar kinematic of a class of member galaxies, I use the spectra extracted from the MUSE data cube. For example, these are three examples of spectral extraction. So you see three galaxies here. This is the aperture for the spectral extraction. This is the spectrum, and the red line is the fit to the spectrum. And it essentially measure the velocity expansion. So to measure the velocity expansion, we use the software called PPXF developed by Capellari. And uh, we were able to measure the velocity expansion of about 50 uh, galaxies per cluster in a magnitude rate between four and five magnitude and with a signal to noise um, higher than 10. And these are the results. So the data point that you see in these three plots are the measured velocity expression of the, of the cluster galaxies against the, uh, their luminosity in the HST band F160. So the color of the point is uh, related to a mean signal to noise of the a, of a, of a spectra, of a galaxy spectra. Instead, the green uh, lines in the three plots uh, are the fit of the measured kinematic. So is the, the green line is the fit to the data point, essentially. So um, I also plotted in these three figures um, the scale in relation predicted by um, previous lens model for this free cluster made by um, Gabriel Camigna and Massimo Bonamigo, that are the uh, red and blue curve. So none of these two models include a kinematic information for the cluster galaxies. But uh, for example, uh, instead of the uh, Bonamigo model include um, instead of the, um, the description of the hot gas of a cluster. So the difference between these two curves is that the uh, red model includes also the gas fitted from the Chandra X-ray observation. So if you look to the result, you see, for, for example, for this cluster, that you call MAX1206, there is a quite good agreement between the predict best fit uh, scaling relation from the last model and the measured kinematic velocity expression. Um, so the measured velocity expression of the galaxies. Instead, for these two clusters here, in the lower panels, you see a non-negligible mismatch between the scaling relation predicted by the previous lens model without any kinematical information and the measured velocity expression of the cluster member galaxies. This is quite uh, clear. The mismatch is here is quite clear, but there is also a mismatch here. And another important thing to mention is that for example, this band, the band, um, the color band, for example, of the red band here. Um, is the one sigma error on the predicted scaling relation. So you see that the band here is very large. This means that there is a strong degeneracy between uh, the parameter of the, the fitted parameter of the scaling relations. So what I did in my work is essentially to use a Bayesian approach to fit uh, the measured galaxy velocity dispersion and and the posterior of this uh, Bayesian fit are used as prior inside the lens model. So just to summarize, to, to explain better, I have, uh, um, for example, 50 major velocity expression of a galaxy. I fit this measurement with a Bayesian approach, and I obtain the posterior distribution of the uh, best fit scaling relation that are here. Then I use this posterior distribution as prior into cluster lens model. And in, two, in reality, into the parameter of the scaling, of the scaling region of the cluster lens model. And these are the results. So now, um, if you see here, for example, this is exactly the degeneracy that I showed you before, um, the degeneracy between the central velocity expression of the, uh, the reference value of the, of the cluster member scaling relation and the reference value of the truncation uh, radius of, for the galaxies. So you see here, for example, um, in blue, the degeneracy obtained from the lens model by Camigna 
in red you see the degeneracy obtained using the, less, the previous lens model by um, by Mario Bonamigo. I want to remind you that none of these two models include a kinematic prior. And also here you can see, for example, also that the Bonamigo model predict two uh, possible solutions to the lens model, two peaks in the posterior distribution for marginalized on these two parameters. While in green here, I'm plotting my posterior distribution in, using the model that includes the kinematic prior. So just look into this figure, it is obvious that the introduction of the kinematic prior is able to break, to reduce the degeneracy between the, these two parameters of the cluster member scaling relation. And for example, now you can also discriminate between different solutions of a lens model. So for example, in previous lens model by Bonamigo, um, there were two solutions, but now only the upper peaks is uh, compatible with the kinematic measurement. And another important result is, is that when we renormalize the um, value of the value that you obtain from the lens model for the free model that we studied, so for the, um, for the free class at 1206, 0416, at 2248, when we renormalize the value of the truncation radius and central velocity spectrum to the same absolute luminosity, we obtain essentially um, free uh, distribution of the uh, perfectly um, overlapped. So this means essentially that in principle we can derive a empirical universal scaling relation between, for example, the total mass of the cluster galaxies and their central velocity dispersion, or also another relation similar to this one, that is a relation between also for, um, the truncation radius of the galaxies and the galaxy central velocity dispersion. So. Uh, yes, these new techniques demonstrate that it is possible to well constrain the Sabelo component of the cluster and open also the possibility to compare um, this uh, observed cluster Sabelo with the prediction of the uh, cosmological simulation. This is a work that Massimo did and probably uh, will present it in a, in a talk soon. And OK, now I was just to spend a few minutes speaking about a, a further improvement of the lens model of 0416. So this is one of the three clusters that I already studied in my previous work. Um, 0416 was observed by Muse in two point things. So um, a southern west um, pointing of about 11 hours and a north pointing of two hours, but recently, Thanks to a proposal by Eros Pandella, another muse observers, ultra deep muse observation of 15 hours was carried out on the northern part of the cluster. So 15 hours uh, um, became 17 hours in the overlap region between the previous and the new uh, data cubes. So, Pietro, sorry, could you yes. please hide the, 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 the tag at the very bottom of your slide since it's hiding? This one? Yeah, that one. Yes. Ah, so, oh, sorry. What I what happened? Okay. Yeah, there we go. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> so in this table, it's just showing a comparison between my previous lens model for this class for 0416. Uh, in this model, I I didn't use the obviously the muse data cube, um, ultra deep um, data cube in the north. And a new lens model for this cluster that I developed using also the new MUSE data in, a, in the north region of, of the cluster. So the, dis, the difference is quite impressive because now, thanks to the new deep uh, pointing, we were able to, 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 to find uh, 18 more images uh, inside the cluster field. And also, um, we discover. 20 more cluster member galaxies with a spectroscopic confirmation. And also, I, I was able to measure uh, 64 um, velocity dispersion for the cluster galaxies inside the MUSE data cubes. So I want to remind you that my previous result was obtained fitting of a measure velocity dispersion of only 49 galaxies. And another uh, strange thing is that, that despite uh, the new model with a deep muse cube contain about 80% more images than my previous model, 
the RMS um, between the displacement of the observed and model predicting multiple images decreases by about 0.21 arc seconds. So this means that despite we have more images, the error um, in the prediction of their position is decreased. And in particular here, you can see, for example, the displacement between the predicted and observed images uh, in the north and in the south. And just to conclude, probably I have um, just a few minutes, uh, a couple of minutes, so I want to show you uh, another beautiful <laughs> example of um, strong lensing that we observe inside this cluster. And in particular, this is um, um, a system of multiple images. And we discover seven of, of this kind of system inside this cluster. And these systems are particularly useful to constrain uh, the position of the critical lines of the lens model, um, of a cluster lens model. So the system is here. Now, we zoom it here. So within, within our group, we call this system the space invader because <laughs> due to the similarity with the protagonist of a video game. The system essentially is composed by two images of the same extended source that are mirrored across uh, by the critical line of the cluster. So in blue here, you see the critical line. Here you see um, point light knots that we identified inside the extended source that you see in blue. And also each knot is mirrored on the other side of a critical line. So we see these are essentially two merging images of the same source. My model also predicts another third image um, for this uh, space invader that is here. And the, this image um, is superimposed to a cluster member galaxy. So this is why it assumes the shape of an ice ring, because this is a a beautiful example of a galaxy scale strong lensing system where a single galaxy is, a, is affecting a lot the shape of the background source. And here you see the predictive position of the knots that are here by my model. So if you look to the Muse data cube in the position of these two, uh, no, this free image of a space invader, you see a strong O2 emission visible here. So if you look, these, these are a movie created um, um, from the Muse data cube. So essentially, we are moving on the wavelength axis of the, data, on the Muse data cube. And you see, this is the galaxy that is here. But around this galaxy and also here, you see a stronger two emission and also something that look like a rotation pattern. In fact, we were able to derive from the Muse data cubes a beautiful rotation curve for this object. So what is length here, the source of this uh, space invader in reality is probably something that is rotating, probably a spiral galaxy. In fact, you see here the, the rotation that is mirrored ag again across the critical line of the cluster. And the rotation is also visible in the third image of a space invader here. This is the critical line. This is a uh, uh, almost perfect ice terrain and the galaxy that split, the, that create the ester ring of a space invader is uh, here where there is the white uh, region inside this plot here. So probably I finished my time. So I want to show you the conclusion. Probably I have no time to discuss each point, but the point of the conclusion, but if you have question, I'm here and. Very nice. Thanks a lot, Pietro. Any questions? Comment for uh, Pietro. Raise your hand. So I have actually a curiosity. Mm -hmm. So in uh, constructing your uh, kinematical prior to feed your uh, your models, mm -hmm. so gain any thing by combining different HST bands with your uh, sigma. Uh, values. So at some point you showed a sigma versus magnitude uh, plot, which are both proxies of mass. Mm -hmm. So have you played by changing 
the x-axis, so the, 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 the band that you use to derive the luminosity of galaxies, and do you gain anything in doing that? In reality, now we are using this particular band because it's a good proxy. Um, for example, there is a paper by Grillo 2015 that demonstrates that the, this particular band is a good proxy of a stellar mass of a galaxy. And since in our lens model, we want to, um, to parameterize scaling relation that will reproduce the mass of a cluster of galaxies, this is the best band that you can use. Okay. So um, this is why we are, we are using this band. OK. Um, because we want to trace the mass of a galaxy. And, and the mass, uh, we if we assume that there is, a, for example, um, um, constant relation between the stellar mass of a galaxy and the total mass. And since the total the stellar mass is well constrained by this luminosity, uh, this is why we, okay. we choose this band. Thank you. Any other question? Curiosity? Uh, it's now here. I have please. a curiosity, so can I go? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, nice talk, Pietro. Uh, just looking to this plot, uh, it seems mm -hmm. to me that uh, most of the behavior is driven by the BCZ. Mm -hmm. How well is determined the BCZ for this cluster and how is important the, the, mm -hmm. the point uh, related to the BCZ in this plot? Okay, in reality, for example, in my last model, that is this one, the model that, that I discussed here, in this model, I try to fit uh, um, the cluster member scale relation both including the BCG or also excluding the BCG. And the differences are very are really negligible because we are speaking of about 10 kilometers per second. You have to consider, for example, here, the, the scatter around these relations. OK, in my Bayesian approach, in my Bayesian fit, I fit also the scatter. So the scatter of the galaxies around the scale relation is about 30 kilometers per second. So. With the inclusion or exclusion of a BCG, essentially the posterior distribution of the fit are essentially unchanged. But now uh, I'm publishing also another paper with, in, with a wrapper to, to well-known uh, lensing codes when you can specify galaxy by galaxy the velocity special that you want to use. So uh, it's a way to introduce the scatter of the scaling relation inside the lens model. And the differences are quite negligible for most of the clusters. The problem arises only when you have, for example, a galaxy scale strolancy system. Because obviously, if you have a, a galaxy that, have a, that is determinant in the creation of several multiple images, obviously, there you have to constrain the, the velocity expression of this particular galaxy in detail. And this is the reason, for example, why in our model we um, we usually exclude the galaxy scale strongness system from the cluster member scaling relation, but we optimize this system separately with um, other potentials. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if there are no other questions, we can thank Pietro again. So we won't have our usual joint astrophysical colloquium on Thursday. We will reconvene next Tuesday with the astrophysics tools. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Grazie mille. Grazie.